Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. I'm going to go ahead and, and get started and people can trickle in as they come. Um, so early this morning, um, we hit homicide number 37 for Lexington, which ties the record that was set last year. So um, it looks like we'll we'll have another record breaking year in regards to homicides in Lexington. And so I just wanted to hop on here, um, tell you how I'm feeling um, kind of let you know, you know, what we're doing, the work that we're doing and just extend my, my thoughts and, and my feelings to those that are being, being impacted. First and foremost, um, I have not personally been in touch with the family of, um, the gentleman that was found dead last night. Um, but I'm sure we will within the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, but obviously my thoughts and prayers to, um, his family, my thoughts and prayers to everyone that has been impacted by gun violence this year, all the survivors, all the mothers and fathers who have lost children, um, all the children, um, who have lost mothers and fathers, um, to those extended family members and friends and classmates and coworkers who have been impacted. Um, this has been a really, really tough year. And so um, I, I, I want to start with that. You know, what I mean, I know we in a political season, you know, we got an election coming up. I know, you know, news headlines got to do what they do. And a lot of times, man, we don't see past um, our political frustrations or affiliations or the news headlines. But we forget, like, these people that lose their life are never coming back ever. You know what I'm saying? And I think we forget those that are left behind um, to deal with the loss of loved ones moving forward. Like we don't think about people anymore. All we think about is headlines and politics, headlines and politics. But these are actual people that are dealing with this. And so we got to keep them in our prayers. Um, and we got to think about the residual impact that all of this violence is having on our, on our adults, obviously, but on our young people, there's a residual impact. There's a trauma that these young people are dealing with, um, that they will have to continue to deal with and navigate, and they don't have the tools to navigate it. And so when you are almost becoming numb and forced to deal with this kind of loss um, after the pandemic and now with gun violence rising, um, I pray and, and I worry and I hurt for our young people. Um, and so I want to start there. want to start there first and foremost. Um, secondly, and, and obviously, you know, I work in city government. Um, I work in the mayor's office, a mayor who um, I support very, very much. A mayor who, um, if you go back and look at history, she has done more than any other mayor in regards to violence prevention and intervention. Now, part of that is she's had to because we've never seen this level of gun violence. And so, um, but before I even go there, I, I want to say this. A lot of people want to compare 2022 to 2002 or maybe even 2012. When things were a little bit more peaceful, when conflicts were resolved in different ways um, and to see how things are now. And I think that there's a multitude of reasons that we got to understand. Number one, this is not 2002. We are seeing things in 2022 that we did not see 20 years ago that didn't exist. Right. So part of it is that. But then the other part is. There are systemic barriers, disparities and challenges within our community that have been going on for decades. And this is now a culmination of some of those issues. So we are now seeing affordable housing 
in the news, right? 24 seven, but that's been an issue for decades. When we talk about gentrification and the destruction of community, the displacement of individuals who only know one village, that is now playing a part in some of the things that we are seeing. When you see lack of um, disparity in leadership positions in companies all across this community, that is playing a part in what we are seeing. When you are seeing young people um, without positive male influences in their life, without community centers at every single corner that they can go into, and that can be a, a refuge to a lifestyle that they really don't want, but they feel like they don't have a choice, that's playing a part in, in what we're seeing. Lack of jobs, being house broke. You shouldn't be going out working 40, 50 hours a week and you're still struggling. We got a lot of families that are dealing with that. Drug use. When I was coming up, they glorified the drug dealer. Now we glorify the drug user and neither should be glorified but we are now living in a generation where drug use is running rampant through every public amplified platform that exists, whether it's social media, music, Netflix. Our young people are growing up in a generation where drug use is, is very accessible and it is actually glorified. So we got a lot of young people that are self-medicating or self are destroying themselves. And so we recently had a village conference that talked about drug use, trauma and violence and how all of it correlates. I know the old model and a lot of people think, oh, it's just a lot of drug dealing. There's a lot of shooting and killing out here because of drugs. Yeah, there's a lot of young people that are under the influence. That's playing a role in what we're seeing. Social media didn't exist 20 years ago. We just buried a young man not too long ago because of a disc record that was made and posted online, which caused a conflict. And that's exacerbated conflict now amongst our young people with social media. Drill music. That is playing a huge role in what we are seeing. Hip hop is still the most influential, impactful genre, music, culture in the world. It's always been what not just young people, but every other culture took its cues from. It's always been the tone setter, period. I don't care what neighborhood you come from. Now, the lack of disparity, or excuse me, the lack of diversity on a mainstream level. Drill music, controlling the industry. Now you have a generation of young people growing up where drug use is amplified, where gang culture and drill culture is being beat into their head, that they think this is a reality. We already have so many young people who are growing up in conditions and circumstances that they can't avoid the cycle of violence. And that's some of the systemic stuff that has led them into them circumstances. But now that's being convoluted by a bunch of kids from the burbs that aren't in those circumstances. But the culture is dictating how they act and their actions moving forward. And you are seeing this perfect storm of young people that feel that they got to be under the influence, that they got to be carrying firearms and that there's only one way to resolve conflict. Mental health is playing a huge role in what we are seeing today. There's a reason that all over the country we've seen a spike in gun violence, not just in Lexington, everywhere. People are hurting. Black people are hurting. There's racial trauma that was endured during the social unrest. A lot of people of color were already dealing with this distrust, already dealing with this daily trauma, already dealing with the mental health of 
of all the disparities and in inequities and the microaggressions. And they were already dealing with that. Then they get into 2020, a global pandemic comes. We're going to lock you up in that. You in the house. You can't move. The only thing you can do is turn on your TV. And then guess what happened in 2020? Breonna Taylor. Ahmaud Arbery. But Ahmaud Arbery. All of these black lives were taken in situations where they should not have been. And now we are seeing that on a 24 hour loop. All while in the middle of a of an, a presidential election with a bunch of racial undertones. And we are locked in the house, forced to see this on the 24 hour news loop. So you got a lot of people of color that are dealing with that trauma. The residual impacts of that trauma stacked on trauma that was already there. Then all of us, regardless of race and culture, dealing with the mental health from the pandemic. Some of us, me and my family included, were barely hanging on by the services, community services that were being provided. Whether that's mental health services, whether that's food services, whether that's um, services for our young people and our children. So now you snatch all. There was a lot of us barely hanging on, still struggling with those services. Some of those services were keeping us alive, our families alive in good mental health. Now you take almost two years and you snatch all those services away. All those mentors snatched away from those kids. All the programming snatched away from those kids. Community centers closed. Schools where a lot of our children, this is where they got their square meal. This is where they get their positive interaction. We're going to snatch that away. Education, we're going to snatch that away. All of it. Man, you can't minimize the impact that that's had on people's mental health in the way that they interact with each other, in the way that we resolve conflict. So now we're dealing with the mental health of that. There was this culture of decorum, of respect that I think was obliterated during the election cycle. In my 41 years of being alive, almost 42 years, I've never seen our country as divided as it was in 2020. I've never seen nothing like it. So now it bred this culture of I don't care about you. It's all about me. I think that plays a role in what we are seeing. That's just me. The impact of that. Then we finally creep our way out of the pandemic and inflation takes off. I, I talk to young people. I work with people. I'm in a community. Brothers and sisters that I know. Saying, bro, I was barely hanging on. Now gas almost $5. Now I go to the grocery store and the loaf of bread is crazy. I might have to go back to the streets. So much is just playing a part in what we are seeing. And then to stick to Lexington, I apologize for y'all for me not me not uh, responding to the comments because I'm locked in. But then, I, but then I think about Lexington, right? And this is one thing that we have to be honest. If we're going to talk about this, we got to be honest. In Lexington, we are seeing something that we've never seen before. And I pray to God we never see again. We have some of the same issues that we've had post-pandemic, right? There's so many guns on the street. So don't compare this to 15, 20 years ago. I don't want to hear the comparisons because there's never been this many guns on the street. When I go to 306 graders and I have an assembly and I ask how many of you have seen a gun in real life and all 300 of them raise their hand. I don't want you comparing this to 20 years ago. I don't, I don't want to hear that. Guns are more accessible. They're on the street. And that's because of the policies and laws. But that's also because of the culture. And then what a lot of people don't understand is the more violence that we see, the more fear that is perpetuated. We just had young people speak in, in our recent podcast. Said, Mr. Devon, I hear what you're saying. I love you, bro. This is a middle schooler. 
I love you, bro. I know y'all say guns is bad, this, that, and the third, but I'm holding my strap because I don't want nobody to hurt me or my family. So now, because of the more violence, because of the more guns on the street, now young people are carrying and holding in case they got to protect themselves, which creates more opportunity for a mistake to be made with that firearm. So we're seeing more guns on the street. Also in Lexington, everybody wants to get on the chief and get on the police department. They are 100 police officers short. That impacts the job that they are able to do. Even if they were fully staffed, it's hard enough for police to be everywhere. They're 100 officers short. We could talk about strategies. We could talk about policies, programs all day, but that plays a part. We don't want to talk about that. And part of that is because, yes, we are coming out of 2020 where we were spending a whole year challenging all of our police departments to make sure they are moving in an equitable way, making sure they are moving in a fair way as we should. We should be holding them accountable. But I think the residual impacts of that accountability is forcing us to not respect the job in 2022. So we're not respecting public safety and the things that they are dealing with. That plays a part. Another thing that makes Lexington different, because everybody wants to make this one monolith thing, because it's easier if you have a boogeyman to blame. Right. It's easier if we just if we frame the narrative as just a bunch of young gangs shooting and killing each other. That's the way the news frames it. That's the way a lot of people framed it. I, this year we have had 37 homicides, right? Only 31 of them are gun related. But you hear, I've seen people of some of the biggest organizations in the city stand up in front of hundreds of people and, and they say, gun violence is running rampant in our community. We have 37 homicides. And I'm sitting there thinking, but all of them aren't gun related. So, but, but, and I know that that's like, tit for tat and i know that that feels like i'm i'm, I'm parsing words and, and trying to be a word magician i'm not all i'm saying is that shows you how we are lumping all of this together and it makes it a lot easier if we can frame it as one monolith issue but if god has shown us anything in 2022 he has showed us that it is going to take every single person in the city of lexington in order for us to see gun violence reduction or reduction in crime, violent crime, however you want to label it. Because we have seen everything. I never would have thought the work that One Lexington does focuses on youth and young adult gun violence. We have actually seen a decrease in gun violence amongst youth and young adults. I never thought in a year where we would bring youth and young adult homicides down 50% that we would actually be looking at a record-breaking year. Because that goes to show you that it's not just a bunch of young gangs shooting and killing each other. The majority of the homicides this year have been people my age. Last year at this time, we had zero domestic violence related homicides. And for those that want to convolute the term, domestic violence is within a household. This is not just interpersonal violence. This is domestic violence. We had a young mother, God rest their soul, take the life of her two children. We had a man shoot and kill his two grown daughters and his wife and plan to shoot and kill herself. We had a man, a grown man, stab and kill his mother. We had two young teenagers, three teenagers, come to defense of their mother who was being domestically abused and they got shot and killed or shot and killed somebody. <laughs> we have... A third of our homicides this year are domestic violence related. We've never seen anything like that. But we're not going to talk about that because that doesn't fit the narrative. The narrative is just a, a bunch of young people of color shooting and killing each other. But what God has done this year, because we have had a shooting at a frat party at UK's campus. We have had a shooting at the Legend Stadium. We have had shootings in Hamburg. We have had shootings at the mall. And if that has has taught us one thing, we got to stop framing this as one race, one neighborhood, one gender. Last year, last night, apparently there was an incident where a young girl pulled a gun out. So in two and, and I think we're getting to that place. 
And I think after this election goes through, I think we'll even come together more. It's the natural order of society, of local national politics. Because the only way you really make something better is when everybody comes together, right? But you've seen it in national politics, you see it in local politics. Nobody really comes all the way together in an election year because there's so much at stake. Everybody wants to leverage their influence. Everybody wants to leverage whatever power they feel they have. And so nobody really wants to collaborate with that person because that person might be on the other side and my side got to win. And so right now we're dealing with that. But as soon as we get past this election, either way it goes, I think we're going to truly be able to come together as a community. I know we will. But if God has shown us anything in 2022, he showed us that it, that this that this Violent crime and gun violence is impacting all of us. Point blank, period. All of us. Every stretch, nook and cranny, corner and neighborhood in this city is being impacted. So now what are we going to do? It's not a one person job. I see people bashing me, bashing the chief or bashing the mayor. Or bashing. Me. Are y'all crazy? Y'all think this is a one person job? Y'all. Boy, boy. I work with survivors each and every week and I see their pain. I see their struggles. I see their mental health depleting. I just went and visited a young person who lost his dad. You know, went and seen him at school. He just came and gave me the biggest hug and teared up. It's, these young people are hurting. And so I want to close with, with this. I want to close. And I apologize for those tuning in. If you have commented, I'm not even looking at my comments. So I apologize. I just really want to get this off. But I want to close with this because I'm a glass half full and I'm a hopeful person, right? I got a lot of work to do today. You know, Sunday is my day. I know, Lord, I apologize. I know Sunday is supposed to be, we supposed to chill, day of rest, whatever. But Sunday is when I clock in because I'm getting ready for the week. And I'm looking at the things that we've done with the youth in the community this year through One Lex, seeing what's worked and what hasn't worked. And we, we've had a lot of good things working, right? But how can we duplicate that? You know what I'm saying? Um, Tanya Lindsay asked me a question at a community forum. She said, you're working a lot with the youth. The youth is, okay, but what you doing for the young men? I just had a, a survivor, a mother whose son is 23, was shot, and shot recently. Um, and he's rehabilitating and recovering. And she challenged me as well. What We got to do something. A lot of these young men respect you, Divine. What are you doing for these young men, 25, 30 years old, right? And so that, it, you know, that's really what I want to lock in and focus on going to 2023, okay? We have seen a decrease in the normal pocket that's usually increasing the last five years. We have seen a decrease there. So that's something we can feel good about. But we're also seeing other things, maybe under po other possible trends. Maybe it's just anomalies. I mean, I don't know, but we're seeing other things. We got to focus on those too. Prevention is obviously the key. There's a lot of individuals who, who are not on the news like me. You know what I mean? I'm constantly on the news because I want to balance that news cycle out. Because they're going to control the narrative, right? And so... I'm constantly going to get on the news to try to tell the other side to make sure the narrative is not controlled. But there's a lot of individuals on the block, in the streets. There's a lot of teachers in the classrooms. There's a lot of organizations behind the scenes helping these families relocate and, and support these, these survivors that you'll never hear about. And those are the people that we rely on each and every day and they're doing great, great work. There's a lot of support that our mayor has given not only to one Lexington, but the city. But what you have to understand is there is no infrastructure for this kind of gun violence because we've never had this kind of gun violence in Lexington. So some of it, yes, the policies of the past, systems of the past, that were dismantled, that, that maybe that we got lazy on. And, and so systemically now we're seeing the culmination of those mistakes. But as far as an infrastructure, we've never seen what we've seen. So this mayor has done a great job in helping us begin to build that infrastructure, but it's gonna take more than a year or two. Our city was dealing with a global pandemic. Now that we're out of the pandemic where we were losing hundreds of lives, thousands of lives, 
opioid crisis. We're losing thousands of lives. So now we're also trying to focus on this. And so we're building an infrastructure, but it's not something that's going to happen overnight. You just got to keep the faith, man. We got to keep God first. And then we got to keep people second. Don't forget the people when we're thinking about this issue. Those that have lost their lives, those that are dealing with loved ones lost, our survivors, we cannot forget them. Shout to the sheriff's office, the police department. Shouts to people within the justice system. Are there things that could be done better in those in, in those entities? Yes. Are there things that could be done better within the city? Um, One Lexington, the mayor's office? Yes. You know what I mean? We are all learning from our mistakes. We are all continuing to do the work each and every day. Shout to all of the agencies from Lexington Rescue Mission to, to Urban Impact, to OMAC, to MAID, to, to SWAG, to YAP, to, you know what I mean, to, to Peace, to, you know what I mean, One Lexington, to Rafiki Center, to Kids Make It, to shout to all the council members who have been locked in on this issue and, and, and holding not only the city accountable, but challenging their residents to rise up. And that's probably the perfect place to close. I'm going to let y'all go because I know it's Sunday morning. And I told my wife I was running up here to get stamps and I've been gone for an hour. But any great movement, and I, I know you've heard me say this a million times, right? Any great movement civil rights movement, women's movement, Black Lives Matter movement, Me Too movement, LGBTQ movement, plus movement, any great movement for change in our society, if you look back in our history, always came from within. It wasn't the government that led that movement. That's why I love accountability. Anybody will tell you, you can come to me and you can cuss the city out, the mayor out, Divine out, one Lexington out, and I'm going to listen. Because that is your job. But it is not our job to come in and make the change. The change has to start from within and then you come and hold us accountable. You let us know what disparities exist that are keeping you from achieving your goal as a community. And it is our job to remove those barriers. But you have to rise up. You have to say, we've had enough. Not on my watch. No more. Change starts right here. And when you do that, and you come to us, then you hold us accountable. And a lot of times power structures are either unaware or they're unwilling. It's one of the two things. Unaware, unwilling, or detached. And you rising up remedies all three of those. Because if you were just unattached, you believe in the movement, but you want to attach. Now you're reminded and you act. If you are unaware, because maybe you don't have that lived experience. Maybe that's not been the focus of, of your policies. That's not been the focus of what you do. Now the community has showed you. Now you like, okay, you know better, you do better. And if you are unwilling, the political pressure that is levied by the power of the people forces those in leadership to change. So either way you look at it, the power is with the people. We got to rise up. And that's been one of the challenges for me because I just be wanting to go out there and be the activist and rally the people. But now I'm on the other side waiting for somebody to take that mantle and so I can reach across and together we can make some shit happen. Y'all gotta rise up. There's a block party, I think, on Charles Ave this weekend. You gotta rise up. 
Something at William Wells Brown, I think, this week. Gotta rise up. Southside Day, every father's hood. You gotta rise up. Jazz in the park and West End. We gotta rise up. Community members going to the news station, voicing their opinions. We gotta rise up. Dina Mullins coming to Taste Creek Middle School and talking about the, the, the death of her son and how it impacted her and her having a whole gym full of middle schoolers quiet because they were listening to her. We got to rise up. Stop the bleed going around teaching all residents how to react when somebody gets shot and how to treat a gunshot wound. We got to rise up. Me turning on the news station to seeing my boy Logan with May saying he's in 13 schools mentoring these young people doing gang prevention, gun violence prevention. We got to rise up. Seeing Urban Impact and the Lexington Leadership Foundation create a violence prevention wing of their organization that they've never had, but they are answering the call of God. We got to rise up. Seeing Black Achievers program explode. And how many people are being a part of that program? Another uh, outlet for our young people. We got to rise up. Seeing our young people um, use dance, use music, use poetry as a positive outlet. We got to rise up. Going to LTMS and seeing a couple kids who I know were this close to being out there in the street saying, Mr. Devine, I'm playing football this year. Did you see my tackle last week? We got to rise up. Seeing the Lexington Ravens doing what they doing, man. We got to rise up. Seeing Damian Riley, you know what I mean? Even though me and him got to have a conversation. Seeing Damian Riley got Project Body Bag coming up. We got to rise up. Seeing Corey Dunn focus on this boxing. I just went out and responded. I just went out and responded to a mother. Sent me a call. Yo. People out here bullying my son and my daughter. They bringing guns around the house. I said, I'm on my way. I go out there through that relationship. I connected with the Voyage Movement. Terry Dunford been working with her. Now we're going to get both of her sons in boxing with Corey Dunn. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? We got to rise up. This is, the, this is what it's going to take. All of us working together, man. But it starts from the community. You within your neighborhood. You within your neighborhood got to start right there and say, we've had enough. We're not going to be held hostage to what's going on. We're tired of losing our young people, our, our elders. We're tired of losing folks. So we going to stand up. All right, one Lexington. Look, we got an issue with it. We rising up. We finna stand up, but I got an issue with this. I need your help. I got you. Then that's when the government, the city comes in and, and it's, a, it's there to support you. Because one thing you don't want is you do not want the city, you do not want the government coming in controlling your neighborhood. Telling you what you're supposed to be doing. Coming in controlling everything. We never want that. Our job is to support you as you rise. Our job is to remove the obstacles so you can do what you need to do as a community. Come on, man. I love Lexington so much, man. I, You know, I really do, man. It, and it makes me emotional because I really do love our city. I, all jokes aside, not being hyperbolic, you know what I mean? Like, I, I really do love Lexington, man. I really do. I give it my give it my all. I promise. You know, when I took this position a year and a half ago, one Lexington, I didn't say I would be perfect in everything, but I said I would give you my all. I would do my due diligence, and, and I and I really have, and I promise to continue to do that. And I honestly think next year is going to be better. I don't think we're going to have twelve domestic violence related homicides. I hope, right? You know, I, I you know I just glass half full. I think things are going to be better. I think you're seeing more pockets of the community rise up. I think you're seeing more people come together. I think as we move past this election, you'll see even more people come together. Um, and I really think we're going to be in a better place in 2023. I honestly believe that, man. But we got a few rough days ahead. We're going to break this record. All right, we, we, we're, we're going to break it. We got almost a third, we got third of the year left and we already tied for last year. So we're going to break the record. 
It's going to be some headlines. It's going to be some rough days. But I think we on the right track, and I think we can get to the right track. Everybody just got to play a part. I'm up here at the, the Beaumont Kroger, man, and it was this this young white, uh, older white woman, excuse me. She came to me. She said, you Mr. Karma? And I said, Karama. She said, yes. She said, I just wanted to tell you I love what you all are doing. Um, is there anything I can do? I'm just an old, older white woman. No lived experience, never lived in the street, come from a pretty, pretty good household. Is there anything somebody like me can do? And it just continued to challenge me. And it let me know that there's so many people that want to be a part of this fight. But we got to be able to give them the tools to be a part of this fight. So, anyway, love y'all. Just want to address that. Um, wanted to let the city know, man, that us at the city, not just through the mayor's office, but through social services, Parks and Rec, doing an incredible job, incredible, incredible job adjustments. You talk about an entity that has listened to the community and made adjustments. Um, Parks and Rec has done a really, really good job um, of the affordable housing, our collaborations with um, Community Action Council. Um, there's there's people that's working each and every day on this, y'all. Um, this is not a matter of ineptitude. This is not a matter of laziness. Um, if anything, we just need a little bit more collaboration. Um, and, and I think things are going to get better moving into next year. It's got to get better. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So anyway, love y'all. Have a blessed day. Have a blessed week. Just going to this week. Obviously, I know we're going to have heavy hearts, especially those of us that are in the work. But just just. Just stay hopeful, man. Keep the faith. Keep God first and the people second. Everything else is is comes after. Politics, ideology, opinions. Keep God first and the people, the power of the people second. All right? All right. Peace and love.